In the previous video, we went through the generation of monoclonal antibodies and the nomenclature for monoclonal antibodies. Now let's talk about uses of monoclonal antibodies. And so we'll talk about drugs that are used to treat diseases. These drugs, quote unquote drugs, are in fact monoclonal antibodies generated in mice and maybe humanized or generated in these genetically engineered mice that produce human heavy chain light chain proteins and thus human antibodies. Um, so the first example I'm going to give you is a drug called rituximavib. This is why I'm not a pharmacist. I hate these drug names. But anytime you see a drug name and the last three letters are M-A-B, that means the drug, quote-unquote drug, is a monoclonal antibody. That's what the M-A-B stands for. So any drug with the last names M-A-B is a monoclonal antibody. So this drug is an anti-CD20 IgG or anti-CD20 antibody. So why would you give this drug to a person? Uh, what's it going to do? So for any monoclonal antibody that's used as a drug, uh, you first have to think about, well, what's the target of the antibody? Well, here it's a protein called CD20. Well, what's CD20? Where is it found in the body? Why do we want an antibody to bind it? So in this instance, CD20 is a protein found on the surface of naive B cells also found on the surface of B cell lymphomas. When we're targeting um, proteins on the surface of cells, sometimes we know what those proteins do. Sometimes we have no idea what they do. Actually, at this point, it doesn't. In this uh, instance, it doesn't matter what CD20 does. At this point, we talk about CD20 as a uh, marker, as a target for antibodies. We want to target a certain type of cell. We know CD20 is found on those cells. Then we can target those cells with an antibody. So this targeting here uh, has nothing to do with the function of the CD20 protein. It has to do with the location of the CD20 protein found on the surface of B cells and B cell lymphomas. So if you are interested in destroying B cells, uh, including naive and cancerous B cells, you can use an antibody that binds CD20. <clears throat> so this drug here, an anti-CD20 antibody, if it's inj injected into, into an individual, that antibody will go and bind CD20. Where do you find CD20? On the surface of B cells, naive B cells, as well as certain types of B cell lymphomas. So we have targeted B cells. What does antibody binding to the surface of cells do? It all depends on the type of antibody. You know, there are different types of IgG. It also depends on the protein-protein interaction between the antibody and the antigen location of the antigen, the number of the antigens on the surface of the cell. So you could never really predict what the antibody is going to do unless you test it. So when this antibody was um, allowed to bind to the surface of cells, it was determined that this antibody uh, triggered the activation of natural killer cells. If you recall, natural killer cells are um, lymphocytes that have on their surface a number of receptors including the FC gamma receptor. So when NK cells bind the FC region of IgGs using their FC gamma receptors, the NK cells, which are lymphocytes, will kill the cell that they're binding to. So in this instance here, these NK cells are going to kill all of these cells. And NK cells work in this method using something called antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. So naturally in the body, NK cells use these FC gamma receptors to target cells covered in IgG. We're using a drug, a foreign molecule injected into the body to get NK cells to target B cells. Why would you want to target B cells? Well, in individuals with B cell lymphomas, you might want to get rid of their B cells. <clears throat> in individuals who have some types of... Uh, autoimmune disorders mediated by B cells, that's another reason why you, you might want to destroy an individual's B cells. So this anti-CD20 antibody will target B cells and result in their destruction via antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. So that's one example. Let's go to another example. There is a drug, uh, brand name Humira, uh, generic name Ad Adalimbub, again, not a pharmacist, hate these drug names, and so that may be, uh, it is a monoclonal antibody. It is generated against the protein TNF-alpha. So scientists injected TNF-alpha into an animal. Um, 
isolated uh, monoclonal antibodies that bound TNF-alpha, why would we want to target TNF-alpha? So if you recall, TNF-alpha plays a big role in inflammation. So we would want to target it to inactivate it to inhibit inflammation. So there are certain autoimmune disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease, I think I've spelled Crohn's disease wrong there, um, that are mediated uh, by TNF-alpha. TNF-alpha is uh, secreted at very high levels in some autoimmune disorders and causing massive inflammation and uh, tissue destruction, um, very bad things. So uh, secreting uh, TNF-alpha, it's a normal part of the job of macrophages, mast cells, other immune cells. And we learned about TNF-alpha when we talked about the innate immune system. So TNF-alpha, it's a cytokine. It's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. It's going to bind many different cells. So it will bind endothelial cells and trigger uh, inflammation in tissues, localized. It goes to the liver. It goes to the hypothalamus. Uh, so TNF-alpha induces inflammation. But in some individuals, they're producing too much in TNF-alpha, maybe because of an autoimmune disorder, and the TNF-alpha is causing uh, too much inflammation, and that's bad. So one way to inhibit TNF-alpha is to generate an antibody to it. So this drug, Humira, is an anti-TNF antibody, and it will bind TNF-alpha. And when it binds TNF-alpha, it prevents TNF-alpha from binding to its receptors. And if TNF-alpha can't bind the TNF-alpha receptor on the surface of target cells, then TNF-alpha will not induce inflammation. And we will destroy the TNF-alpha um, via complement fixation, or we will uh, eat it up using um, antibody-mediated opsonization by macrophages. So actually, we're destroying the TNF-alpha uh, and preventing it from binding its target cells. And that could reduce inflammation. Um, so you'll see, you're seeing that antibody treatment can be used in a number of uh, different um, diseases and disorders. It can be used to target cancer cells. It can be used to um, inhibit autoimmune disorders. It can be used in transplantation biology to inhibit uh, rejection. So let's go through a number of different scenarios by which monoclonal antibodies work. And again, scientists don't know uh, how they work until they make them and then they test them in the lab. So let's say here's a cell, and we want to target the cell. There's some protein or molecule on the surface of, of the cell. We want to generate a monoclonal antibody that binds this protein. And uh, because we want to either get rid of this protein, or we want to inactivate the protein, or we want to target the cell, we want to stop the cell from functioning, and this protein maybe is important for cell function. So you can generate monoclonal antibodies that bind this protein. Now again, what do these antibodies do? It really all depends on the antibody isotype, which version of IgE or Ig. I'm sorry, IgG. It's usually IgG these antibodies are from, and there are different versions of IgG. It also depends on the antigen, the protein on the surface of the cell. It depends on its shape, on the number of it, uh, of those antigens on the surface of the cell. So it really all depends. Um, let's go through a couple of examples. So we saw in a previous example that some monoclonal antibodies, when they bind their target on the surface of cells, they trigger uh, NK cell activation and antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity. So that's one way. Another way is that some of these antibodies could trigger complement activation via the classical pathway. Certain versions of IgG uh, are really good at attracting the C1 molecule. So that's another way that antibodies could work. They don't have to work by all of these ways. They can just work by one of these ways. Um, another way that antibodies work to uh, target disease is they can bl block receptor signaling. If these proteins on the surface of the cell are receptors, maybe growth factor receptors, and these cells, these receptors are essential for the cell to function or to grow, especially in cancer cells. So these um, cells uh, require these receptors for growth. Well, if you make an antibody that binds these receptors, you might be able to stop the signaling in the cell. So these receptors would act as an antagonist. And if you antagonize these receptors, then it's possible that the cell is going to react. And maybe if we're talking about a cancer cells, it will stop growing. So some antibodies 
their uh, functions would be to block receptor signaling into the cell, and that might trigger cell death or apoptosis, for example. Um, another example would be to target, uh, to deliver something to the cells using these monoclonal antibodies. So these antibodies that deliver something are conjugated antibodies. So you can take a monoclonal antibody and attach something to it. You could attach a toxin to it. You could attach a radioisotope to it. So when the antibody binds the target, uh, sometimes the, uh, this whole complex gets internalized. It gets brought into the cell, and that toxin will trigger destruction of that cell. So conjugated antibodies are a way to deliver something into that cell. So these are four different ways that antibodies could work to destroy a target cell or interfere with its function. I'll give you one example here. A very common drug used to treat breast cancer, uh, brand name Herceptin, uh, generic name Trastazamabib, ends with MAB. It is a monoclonal antibody that binds a protein called HER2. HER2 is a protein found on the surface of, of cells in the body, abundant on the surface of some types of breast cancer. So if, it, if a, a person has HER2 positive breast cancer, that means there's a high level of HER2 on the surface of cells, and HER2 um, is uh, responsible for those cells growing uncontrollably. So that antibody binding HER2 will actually trigger two different things. It will, number one, block receptor signaling. Number two, it actually also recruits NK cells to uh, uh, mediate antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. So actually, antibodies can do multiple ones of these uh, activities, and Herceptin is known to do both of those too. Um, let's talk about two more examples of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, here is a compound, a drug, uh, brand name uh, Campath, uh, generic name Alimentazemabib, MAB. It is an antibody that binds the protein CD52. What's CD52? It is a protein found on the surface of many immune cells, lymphocytes, monocytes, macrophages. Again, the function of CD52, not important. The location is what's important. So if this protein is found on the surface of immune cells, we want, want to make an antibody that binds it, and it turns out this antibody triggers the classical pathway of complement activation. So we could lead to um, complement-mediated opsonization or membrane attack complex formation and destruction of all these cells. Why would you want to give this to an individual? Because you want to suppress their immune system. So in individuals who suffer from, let's say, autoimmune disorders or some types of cancer where uh, leukemias or lymphomas where cells are growing uncontrollably, or in some transplantation bi uh, biology where an individual, you want to make sure their immune system is not going to attack uh, the donated organ. These are some instances where CAMPATH is given to a uh, patient in order to reduce the number of immune cells, which will either in an autoimmune disorder, reduce uh, the immune system attack against self, or in cancer, kill the number, kill cancer cells, or in transplant, reduce the number of alloreactive cells. Um, last example of a monoclonal antibody used to treat disease is a drug called omalizumab, MAB. So it's a monoclonal antibody. This is an antibody that binds an antibody. Specifically, a ant it's an anti-IgE antibody. Why would you want an antibody binding an antibody? So, for this, you have to remember the function of IgE. IgE is an antibody that's generated uh, and triggers mast cell degranulation, and it is commonly produced in uh, type 1 hypersensitivity reactions or allergic reactions. So, individuals who are allergic to peanuts or pollen or bee stings or other um, dust mites, for example, um, those individuals would make IgE that mediates their hypersensitivity. So just to review mast cell degranulation, here's a mast cell. Uh, the way the mast cells identify either pathogens or allergens is they have FC epsilon receptors on the surface of their cells. The FC epsilon receptor binds the FC region of IgE. And in the presence of allergens, 
the FC epsilon receptors will crosslink. So you have this thing called FC epsilon receptor crosslinking, and the mast cells degranulate. And this is what's occurring in individuals who have a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. So how can we use monoclonal antibodies to prevent this from happening? So if an individual um, is, let's say, allergic to some allergen, right? They, that means they must be making plasma cells that are secreting IgE that recognizes the allergen, and we know what's going to happen. IgEs get attached to the FC epsilon receptors. But now we're going to treat with a, this drug. It's an anti-IgE antibody. So now this antibody is binding the IgEs. And you can see there, the IgEs are no longer binding the FC epsilon receptor. Now that's occurring in the presence of allergen, IgE is not going to cross-link the FC epsilon receptors and mast cell degranulation will decrease. So this is another example of an antibodies to be used to uh, prevent a process that's occurring in the body. So hopefully after this video, you've come to appreciate the, uh, a few of the different uses of monoclonal antibodies used to treat diseases and disorders.